Gabby with you. Welcome to the Happier Life Project, brought to you by free mental health and wellness app, My Possible Self, in partnership with the Priory Healthcare. Today, we're having a check-in with anxiety. Every human has feelings of anxiety during their life, but when our anxiety gets hyperactive, this anxiety can turn into a disorder and make it a lot more difficult to get through the day. Anxiety disorders are one of, if not the, biggest mental health problem in the world. So it's always really good to check in with yourself and your levels of anxiety. And well done for tuning into this episode. Whether you've got an anxiety disorder or not, knowledge is power for yourself and your loved ones. And we've got some great takeaways that everybody can benefit from on this very episode. Today, leading expert Kimberly Quinlan joins us to talk about all sorts in regards to anxiety, catastrophizing, fear, panic attacks, internet anxiety, health anxiety, sleep anxiety, when it's other people that are making you anxious, and the tiny shifts that we can make to put us on the path to becoming free from the clutches of anxiety. So, ready to find a healthier, happier you? Let's get started. Welcome to the Happier Life Project. Anxiety and OCD specialist Kimberly Quinlan. It's great to have you on the show. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to read this out and hope I get it all correctly. You provide services using the gold standard treatment based on a meta analysis of studies for anxiety, OCD, and depression. You also host the Anxiety Toolkit podcast, talking about and sharing effective, compassionate and science-based tools for anyone with anxiety, OCD, panic and depression. So probably a huge audience there. Plus, you've got a real fan base on Instagram also under the name Your Anxiety Toolkit. So you can add social media influencer to the credentials and your founder of the CBT School which is an online psychoeducation platform where you offer support and research-based educational products to those who cannot access correct care. So that's incredibly admirable. It must be a bit weird for me to read all that back at you, but um, (laughs) (laughs) because you know all that. Yeah, it it is funny to hear it all back. I won't lie, but it is. It's a good feeling. We have to let, you know, everybody listening understand how knowledgeable you are in the, in this area. And to have that kind of workload, you must be incredibly passionate about what you do. Yeah, I am. I'm very passionate about it. And in addition, it's going to sound really strange to say this, is that it comes naturally to me. Like, mm. I, I'm a big feeler. I have had my own struggles. So to me, it's sort of like, no, this is the work I'm meant to do like it's just the work I'm meant to do so as much as I'm passionate about it it just feels like the purpose that I have well they do say that if you love what you do you'll never work a day in your life right that's the old saying that's (laughs) true it is true so this drive then where does it come from can you kind of pinpoint it as like you mentioned you've had your own struggles and you've obviously very empathetic as well um Mm. but was there a moment where you where you were like okay this is this is my purpose well um interestingly I had well it's not interesting but it wasn't interesting at all if I'm gonna say (laughs) I had a pretty severe eating disorder but it was not interesting it was painful and at that time I was a personal trainer Mm -hmm. and those two things don't go very well together because if you're a personal trainer those two can make for a very strong eating disorder. And so I started to go into my own therapy for the eating disorder and then started to realize like so many of my clients are coming for reasons that are mental health based, not actually body based. And I ended up feeling like, no, I'm actually enjoying more of the talking to them about their feelings and why they're there and you know, their anxiety about their body or their anxiety in general. And so I thought, you know, this is what I'm supposed Mm. to be doing. Like it's the work that I just happened to fall into and I'm so grateful for it. So if any, any, any case, my interest and my experience with my eating disorder sort of led me into that arena and I'm so grateful for that. Mm. And you've never looked back. 
No. I don't need to tell you, anxiety is a very broad term. So I thought we could ease ourselves in gently here. What's the difference between somebody who's experiencing anxiety versus somebody who has an anxiety disorder? Because I think because we are talking about mental health more openly now, sometimes the word anxiety or I've got an anxiety disorder, it might get misused and it gets self-diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So number one, every human has anxiety. It's actually not a pathology to have anxiety. If I'm, mm -hmm. I know I'm about to take an international flight and I have anxiety about it, which is normal, right? To have anxiety mm -hmm. about the schedule and the flights and the where, you know, what if the flights don't connect and, and that's anxiety. You might have anxiety about school, your family members, you know, fear and anxiety aren't technically a problem. They're not mm -hmm. something that we should pathologize. Um, it's a part of life. And in fact, it's an important part of our brain that keeps us safe. Anxiety is what tells us not to touch the hot plate on the stove. Anxiety is what tells us to move our fingers away from the door as the door is slamming. So mm -hmm. the anxiety in and of itself isn't actually a bad thing. However, sometimes for some people, the part of your brain that tells you to be anxious and tells you there is danger gets a little hyperactive right think of it like a fire alarm we want a fire alarm they keep us safe they they tell us when there is danger but for people with an anxiety disorder they have one of those fire alarms that go off every time you make toast right like even though it's not mm -hmm dangerous to make toast and the little bit of, you know, um, smoke that comes from toast, if there is any, isn't actually a sign that it's fire. So an anxiety disorder is exactly how it sounds. There's disorder, meaning that it, there's so much anxiety that it takes out the order in your life and creates a, a very strong pull against your daily functioning. Um, you may feel like it's overwhelming that you don't have control over it anymore. And once you're into those sort of categories, then we would make sure that you get a diagnosis so you can get the right care. And I suppose going back to your example of like flying, if you had an anxiety disorder, then that would maybe in when it comes to travel, because people do have sometimes crippling anxiety when it comes to flying, they maybe would never get on a plane. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So again, we, we want to look at it on a spectrum. So everybody has it and it's okay to have it. And you might have it in certain situations in certain parts of your life, like you said, like maybe mm -hmm. flying and so forth. But when it comes to a diagnosis of an anxiety disorder, what we're really looking at there is, is it impacting your functioning? Is it causing you to not do the things you want to do that line up with your values that you value for your life? Like if you love flying, but your anxiety was getting in the way of that, well then, yeah, we would probably look at, look, you know, diagnosing it with anxiety disorder, or at least getting you an understanding and education of what's going on so you can overcome that anxiety. So yes, it's usually, you know, reduction in functioning and definitely takes you away from the things you love and value. Mm. What are some of the most, I guess, widespread types of anxiety disorders that you've come across? Well, my main specialty is a couple of things. So I specialize in obsessive compulsive disorder, which is a very severe anxiety disorder that involves um, obsessions and compulsions. Um, panic disorder is another one where you have severe panic you know, panic or anxiety mm -hmm. attacks. Um, there's social anxiety. Again, some of the, often these will intermix and overlap, right? There's mm -hmm. specific phobias. A lot of people have very, like you talked about flying, needles, vomit. These are very specific phobias that people may have. Um, then we kind of go into more of like a generalized anxiety, um, which is, you know, worrying about daily stresses, um, daily life. Um, mm -hmm. Then we can sort of branch off into post-traumatic stress disorder as well, which I personally wouldn't say I'm a specialist in. I have, you know, a little bit of knowledge, but I um, tend to stay more under these um, 
specific anxiety disorders that act out in these very same ways that aren't trauma related. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's sort of some general, there's also health anxiety, and that's another common one Mm -hmm. for folks. Mm -hmm. And so with the ones that you've just listed, do most of them need prescription medication or can they be managed holistically? Both. So when I am treating treating someone or educating somebody, I really like to look at the research. So right now we have a lot of research that Um, So let's sort of play it out. The treatment for most of these anxiety disorders or all of them is cognitive Mm -hmm. behavioral therapy. We have a lot of research to back that that is the most helpful treatment. Um, The research shows that combining cognitive behavioral therapy with medication is the highest level of care and the best level of care. Mm -hmm. However, if you had to choose between the two, the research shows that CBT gets better outcomes. So Mm -hmm. really, what does that mean? It allows us to be informed that you don't have to take medication. I tell my clients my worst case, my most severe case I've ever treated, did never put a pill in their mouth and they still recovered. So you don't have to take medication. However, the medication can help with the process so that it could often shorten the process of treatment and recovery. Um, Mm. But it's a very personal decision. You Mm. don't have to. You can 100% treat it holistically, like you said. It's really a discussion for you to have with yourself and with your general practitioner. That's reassuring to hear because I think sometimes people are put off getting professional help because they don't want to be put on medication because they think then they'll be on it forever and maybe that's going to give them other health you know side effects or complications that's good to know that we we don't necessarily have to just do it by taking a pill no are there some people that are more susceptible to an anxiety disorder than others yes So we don't know exactly the cause of anxiety. There's no MRI or scan we can take to identify the cause. However, we have a lot of research to show that there are a couple of components that will increase your chances of of getting an anxiety disorder or developing an an anxiety disorder. Number one is genetics. If your Mm. mother or father or someone in your family has an anxiety disorder, you are more likely to get an anxiety disorder. doesn't mean you will, but that can increase your chances. An additional component is more environment, right? Which is Mm -hmm. where you raised in a very stressful, traumatic childhood environment, where you raised with a a culture where there was a lot of pressure and, you know, you had these sort of norms that were very stressful for you. That too can help it be uh, pushing us towards getting that anxiety development. Um, We now have a little more information as well about biological causes. Um, This is still relatively new in the research. Biological causes such as um, Lyme disease or strep throat, some of these conditions Mm -hmm. can increase the chances of developing them. But again, we still often will find there's also a genetic component underneath that as well. Um, Again, the the biological component is newer. So I Mm -hmm. even hesitate to bring that up, but we are sort of starting to understand a more biological impact as well. Mm. What about when it's other people that make you anxious and maybe this weaves in a little bit to like upbringing and like you said pressure and family and like what if you know certain loved ones maybe they're a bit mean or they're volatile but it's somebody that you're close to or it's a colleague at work how do you look after yourself then when if it's other people that are making you feel really anxious Mm -hmm. It's a good question. I think it depends on your age. If you're a a minor, it might be hard to cut ties with those people or remove yourself with those people. Mm -hmm. Um, However, if you're an adult, the thing I always like to think of is, you know, break it down into steps. So if somebody else creates anxiety for me, it's usually an opportunity for me to look at my thoughts about the situation. We don't actually have to remove that person yet because it could be that my thoughts about them and my reactions to them are what's keeping that anxious cycle going. Um, Mm -hmm. And sort of just to step back and help you understand that is 
let's say I go to a party and I walk away feeling like, oh my gosh, I said the wrong thing. I said the wrong thing. I did the Mm -hmm. wrong thing. What if they judge me and so forth? We wouldn't actually say the people judging you is the problem. We had the, actually our thoughts about them judging us is really where we want to identify the problem. And what we mm-hmm. can do there is target the behaviors and reactions I have after going to the party or while I'm at the party to reduce that anxious cycle and to break that anxious cycle, right? So, mm-hmm. so first of all, we want to look at your thoughts and reactions to the situation and see whether it's actually ours. Cause it might be that these people at the party didn't judge me at all, or if they did, it was very mm-hmm. simple. So we mm-hmm. would look at that first. However, as you said, if you are being, you know, bullied, harassed, uh, you know, abused, even in that case, you would if preferably speak with a mental health professional or a trusted adult and talk about whether it's time for you to stop seeing these people or set some very strong boundaries with these people so that they're not continuously hurting you. And that can be done in a numerous set of ways. Um, but again, that usually takes some time to sort of work out. And and again, we want to really separate what is actually happening and what is our thoughts about it. Because again, I'm an anxious person. I can create some pretty crazy scenarios about what people are thinking about me or how things went, right? I could Mm -hmm. leave an event going, oh my gosh, this is really bad. Bad things are going to happen. And somebody else at that event was like, no, it was, it was a bit scary, but it wasn't so bad. So Mm -hmm. I want to really explore our own thoughts and reactions first. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking about like, what if it's say, you've got a parent that doesn't have a good relationship with alcohol and you just know Mm -hmm. that like if they're going to drink too much well it's the situation's going to become unpleasant or maybe you've got uh, a partner or again a parent who's like very critical and Mm -hmm. judgmental so it's not necessarily the extreme of where you'd need to seek some professional help But it goes further than the kind of sort of peer peer pressure kind of self judgment things, you know. There's that kind yeah. of that middle well, ground, right? So, as a therapist, I try always not to give my advice, um, mm-hmm. but to ask a set of questions that can help us get to a solution that feels right for that person. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I I won't even give my own personal opinions here. This is where we would ask some questions. Like if you were to act truly according to your values, what would you do in this situation? So you use the example of a parent who overuses or abuses alcohol one part of us might be like, oh, you're out. You're creating too much anxiety. You're not taking care of your business. Like I need to distance myself from you. And that isn't a wrong response. But what we mm. want to do is really check in like, what would your values have you do here? And usually when we really consider our values, um, maybe your values might say something more like, I'm going to set some limits with them but I don't want to cut them off yet. I want to be in their life, but set some parameters on what I'm okay with and what I will and won't do. Like I will not pick you up if you're drunk from the bar or whatever it may be. Mm. So your the values of each person are going to look very different and will change the reaction and behavior they have. And I am a strong believer, particularly as we talk about anxiety, is to always consider values over everything right? Because also anxiety will say, you know, a a lot of times, and I have this a lot in my practice is people specifically who have a family member who uses alcohol or are really depressed or really anxious, they'll say, I can't set limits with them because if I do, they might do something really bad, right? They might Mm -hmm. hurt themselves or, you know, do risky behaviors. So I can't set that limit. Or just get more aggro, right? Just get more unpleasant to be around. Yeah. So we want to really take a look at those values and let that guide the decision. So going back to you touched upon like the 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 thoughts and um, and sort of looking at our thoughts when we're catastrophizing or or like 
repetitive negative thinking, how do we go about like intercepting those thoughts and not getting sucked into the loop? I guess detaching ourselves, you know, and not sort of believing the irrational fear or worst case scenarios. Yeah. What you've identified is a couple of thought errors that we engage in, one being catastrophization, another really common one, a black and white thinking, right? Like it's either all good or all bad. Mm. The first step here is being able to identify that that's the thought pattern you're in, right? Because anxiety is very convincing. It can convince you that Mm. this is dangerous and it is happening right now and you need to fix it right now. So so a lot of times the first step is more of what we call mindfulness training, becoming aware of your thinking. And that in and of itself is like 50% of the work is if you can catch it, then you can actually make some shifts. So number one, awareness training, being able to identify this is a catastrophic thought or this is a black and white thought or there are multiple different uh, thought errors we engage in. Mm. The second, like you've said, is sort of that detachment. And what we do is we call it diffusion, which is to recognize that the thought is in fact a thought, not a fact. Often when we have anxiety, it feels real, right? In fact, Mm -hmm. one of the most Googled Mm -hmm. terms on, if you do a Google search is, why does anxiety feel real? Like, I think that's (laughs) so classic that that's like the most searched thing because it does feel real, right? So we want to be able to diffuse and recognize that this isn't a fact, it's a thought. Mm -hmm. Identify the thoughts you're having like, oh, and, and then what you can do is you can also identify the feelings you have. Also, feelings aren't facts either. So even if your body is sending out all this anxiety, that's still not evidence that danger is here. Once mm-hmm. we can do those two things, we actually have a lot of opportunity to then change our reaction. Remember, if you have a scary thought and you respond to that thought as if it's true and real, your brain will keep sending that thought as if it's real and true. And that's how you get stuck in a cycle. The way often I always tell this story is patients will almost always come to me and say, Kimberly, if you could just teach me not how to not have these thoughts, I'll be fine. (laughs) And I'll say, if, if I could do that, I would be a millionaire and I would, you know, this would be a wonderful thing, but we Mm -hmm. can't stop thoughts from coming. They often Mm -hmm. just come. We can't stop feelings from coming, but we can change how we react to them. And that is how you break the cycle. And would you apply all of that advice to fear as well? Because fear and anxiety, I mean, they pretty much go hand in hand, don't they? They produce a similar stress response. So when it's a fear of something that's not actually fact, it could be fear of judgment, fear of an outcome, fear of failure, fear of letting somebody down. You know, we can really beat ourselves up in, in that respect and, and just, you know, fear and anxiety, it just gets very much intertwined, doesn't it? Yeah. So yeah. is it again about stepping back? Well, that's the first step. That is the first step. So I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. CBT is what I do. And and what that involves is both a cognitive and a behavioral component. So we've talked about the cognitive part, right? Identifying thoughts and feelings, observing them, acknowledging that they're just because you have them, they're not true. Then, mm. then we can look at that behavioral piece. And remember, when your brain sends out chemicals into your body to tell you there's danger, it's called the FFS response, which is the flight, fight, excuse me, flight Mm -hmm. and freeze. Mm -hmm. Um, There's actually a fourth one, which is called fawn. And we can talk about that later if needed. But our natural response when we're anxious is to run a long way, right? Or to fight them or just to freeze and and do nothing. Mm -hmm. And our goal here is that's the normal response. Again, that's what we need it for. If there was a bus barreling down the street towards us, our brain would send a message to say, get out of the way. And we would, right? Mm -hmm. But what we want to do is when we have that sensation, that anxious sensation that rushes through our body, we then can look at working at changing our reaction, particularly if you've got a brain that sets off the alarm too much Mm -hmm. and too Mm -hmm. often, is we can look at changing the reaction so that you're not constantly running or fighting or freezing. 
And that's how you break that cycle. Because again, one of the most common anxious reactions is avoidance. Our natural instinct when we're anxious is to avoid the thing that makes us anxious. But when we avoid it, we actually reinforce the fear. And so we want to interfere, intervene at that point. Ooh. Can you stop a panic attack in its tracks if you have the tools? You could try, but I don't encourage it. <laughs> right. I'll, I'll tell you why. It's, it's Again, it's frustrating. People want to stop panic attacks. I don't blame them. They're horrible. I yeah. hate having panic attacks. However, again, usually the more you try and stop a panic attack, often the more you have it, right? Mm. Um, you can intervene with certain skills and different reactions to the panic. That's a really skillful action to, to practice. Um, but the common thing that's misunderstood is this idea of thought stopping. A lot of people go, don't think about it, don't think about it, avoid, like, let, let's push it away, push it away. But that in and of itself reinforces the fear and makes you have more of it. So yes, you can you can manage a panic attack with skills and tools. Um, I don't recommend trying to stop it because you usually will have more. Right. So you kind of just got to ride through it. Yeah, I mean, I think language is really important here. So we could say ride through it. And most people screw their nose up at me when I say that. And they're like, what? Like, you want me to just like push through? And I'll say like, let's talk about some different language. Like when you have it, could you compassionately hold space for the discomfort that you feel? That sounds really good to me. That sounds like changing your brain and changing the brain's response by saying, hi, panic, I see you, you're here again, I got you, don't worry, you can be here, I'm going to keep washing the dishes <laughs> and you're going to rise and fall on your own and you're totally welcome to take your time, but I'm going to keep doing the dishes and I'm going to keep playing with my kids because that's what mm. I value. That language is a way different to, oh my gosh, I hope I don't panic. Please make it go away. How can I avoid it? How can I push through? I think language and our body language is a key mm. component there. Mm. I find it so interesting. You even gave a couple of examples saying playing with the kids or doing the dishes. It, it, it can be the most sort of ordinary things where one springs up. It's not necessarily because you, well, certainly unlikely you're going to be chased down the street by a bear but it it yeah. kind of pops up it's almost like delayed isn't it sort of like accumulated stress right or something that's happened that's been stressful and then your body just picks its moment to react because I I suffer or haven't done in a while but suffered from panic disorder and panic attacks and mine would mostly come at night when I was in bed mm. allegedly relaxed <laughs> yes. So, and that's important that you mentioned. So if there were a bear running towards you down the street, the panic would be appropriate, right? Like we would <laughs> yes. actually be grateful for the panic because the panic would help us have a burst of energy so we can run at a very fast rate. But what you're really talking about here is for the 99.9% .9 of the other times when you have panic, which is when you're not being chased down the street by a bear. And yes, you're right. So the way we sort of conceptualize panic and panic disorder is there are those who have very situational panic, meaning when I'm on a plane, I panic, or when I'm getting needles, mm. I panic, or when mm. I leave the house, I panic. And so it's very much related to a trigger. Um, and then there are those who have panic because of a general overwhelm of stress and generalized anxiety. Um, the way we treat them are similar, but a little different in that if it's situational, the treatment is actually to purposely go and do the things and be in the places where the panic comes. That might sound crazy, but it works and it works really, really well. If you do that on rep repetition, you've got yourself an amazing treatment plan. For those who have generalized anxiety and stress, we actually then work at managing the stress. Again, that main question mm. I asked you before, what lines up with your values and looking at realistic expectations, making sure mm. you're getting enough sleep, making sure you're eating well, getting exercise, looking at a healthy lifestyle can make a huge benefit for that kind of panic disorder as well. Yeah. On social media, you asked, 
what would be the best advice you could give to somebody struggling with panic attacks? So I'd like to know what was your favourite answer that you received um, and how you yourself would answer that question. Oh, I'm a bring it on kind of girl. Um, mm -hmm. So again, there's a massive mindset shift that needs to go with recovery. When it comes to anxiety, your natural human response is to say, no, I don't want this. Make it go away. Because no mm -hmm. one wants anxiety. It's not fun. It's horrible, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like I get it. Yeah. And so there's a massive mindset shift that can happen that can really supercharge your recovery, which is bring it on. <laughs> the saying that I say every day with my patients and it, I actually brought, said it once to a patient and she was like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to put that on a T-shirt. And now we do. We have it on T-shirts is it's a beautiful day to do hard things. We've been taught that it should be easy and it shouldn't take a lot of work and it should be, you know, that everyone else is fine. And so mm -hmm. we should be fine too. And I am not a subscriber to that. Life is hard and today's a great day to do hard things. And it's okay if your hard is somebody else's easy. And so when it comes to panic, some people say, this is ridiculous. I shouldn't have so much anxiety getting into an elevator. And I'll mm -hmm. say, it doesn't matter whether other people can do it without anxiety or not. This is your hard thing. Let's bring it on. Let's do it, right? Let's. You could get on the elevator with all clenched fists going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, please no, please no, please no. Or you could get on going, bring it. There's no anxiety that will could ruin me. Let's see how high it can get. Let's have it. And those people tend to recover faster and have longer term recovery because mm. their mindset about anxiety shifted. No. Do you get a bit irritated with people that you work with them and, and that this kind of busyness and badge of honor and it's like, we should live a stressful life and we make ourselves busy, 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 busy. And then you're like, hello, I'm not surprised you're coming to see me with mm. panic attacks or various like anxiety disorders. And I don't want to say we're bringing it on ourselves, but we're kind of in a, in a, you know, much broader scale, we're sort of conditioned that that's how we should be, right? To to yeah. be busy, to always be on the go and to be juggling loads. Yeah, so I know I don't get frustrated because to be honest with you, I could not resonate enough with those folks. Um, mm. And I think that it's important that we look here is there are people who, you know, I think that there's a misconception of people who hustle are like, uh, doing it for the ego. And, and I actually have found a lot of my patients, myself included, get stuck in hustle culture because of either and one of the themes of of anxiety is either hyper responsibility or perfectionism. Mm. Um, and those two themes can drive somebody to push themselves to a limit that breaks them right mm -hmm. um yeah. and so i think culture reinforces this as well so no when i you know to be honest some of the hardest cases to to break that i've had or to really help them recover have been those who are very much fueled by perfectionism and the need to be extraordinary um not because of an ego narcissistic you know tendency but because mm -hmm. It's it's a part of their brain pattern and, and it's and it's something they have to break. Yeah. So then, I mean, I'm sure it's quite complex when you have to start working with somebody and treating that. But like, I feel like that might resonate with quite a, a lot of people listening. Is there some advice you could give in, in terms of like baby steps on how we yeah. could like slow down and not be quite uh, so perfect <laughs> for sure it's totally treatable and that's the exciting news is it's not ever a case of like you're uncur incurable no we work at it in really baby steps and again we go back to that really important question of like are you living according to your values mm. is this working that's another mm. really big question that we have to ask ourselves is the actions and behaviors of your day working for you and often they'll say no. 
in almost mm. all cases. They'll say it feels good and I, I feel like I'm achieving and I'm slowly getting there, but I'm exhausted and I'm sick and I'm now in the doctors and I'm going to the ER mm. and I, you know, I'm depressed. And so we can say this isn't working. What is one tiny shift you can make today? to mm -hmm. make take one step in this direction that we want to be going in just one baby step is all we need today you don't have mm -hmm. to often people are afraid that i'm going to tell them like you have to quit your job or you have to quit your side hustle or you know you have to quit your extracurricular activities ideally yes but no that's not the goal it's actually more of like what could you do in a baby step fashion that could give you just a little bit of release here and help you recover mm. and regenerate energy that you need mm, with the overwhelm mm. when i was doing a bit of research for this episode i came across the term internet anxiety mm. so internet anxiety being the fear or apprehension that individuals experience when using the internet so I'm guessing this could be applicable in various areas, gaming, social media, work, navigating relationships, maybe online dating. How have you seen the use of technology feed anxiety disorders and anxiety in general? Yeah, the biggest one for me is in the Google bar, <laughs> right? Is So there's, there's some wonderful benefits to Google for people with anxiety. However, in many cases, it backfires. So a lot of people I find, as you've listed some really great examples, the anxiety isn't actually the internet, it's what they're seeing on the internet, right? Like, and often it's either they're afraid of what they will see, because mm -hmm. they don't want to see it, or mm -hmm. the information they do see is, as you know, the news is not a friendly, easy place to be these days, that what they do see creates anxiety for them, right? Yeah. And so again, the Google search bar can be beneficial in that we can get some good scientific proof and evidence of things. It can also be a really big anxiety contributor because people are using Google as a form of reassurance. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say, what's so wrong with reassurance? I have anxiety. Shouldn't I be allowed to get reassurance? Absolutely, except when you have anxiety, remember, go back to what we said, if your anxiety is actually not based on fact and is catastrophic in its nature, if you respond to it as if it's a fact, you're actually training your brain to continue being anxious. So the more you search and try and get reassurance, the more you're actually training your brain to be more scared of this thing. Right. Mm. And so that's where the Internet can be a really big problem for folks with anxiety. But in general, I have to limit my own intake because I think it's a healthy thing in terms mm. of it does create anxiety. The news is not a friendly place. Sometimes people are mean on the Internet, which is not helpful either. So I think it's very much a, a thing, again, of asking what lines up with your values. Mm. And comparison, competitiveness, this, I mean, if you're of an anxious disposition, this cannot help at all. Right. I'd imagine health anxiety is probably the biggest, though, when you're <laughs> Googling and yes. hypochondria, having hypochondria. Mm. Again, Google is not really your friend there. <laughs> no, Dr. Google is not a trained medical professional. I do not encourage people to consult with Dr. Google ever. No. <laughs> Again, it, it can be beneficial and it can also create a lot more anxiety. You just have to be careful with your consumption of it. Yeah. Let's go into sleep and intrusive thoughts because they are the loudest here. It's the chicken and the egg thing, isn't it, with sleep and anxiety? It's like if you lie down, your brain can just start the monkey mind is activated, I think, for, for a lot of people. Sure, yeah. So it is very common when the lights are out to have yeah. feel like your thoughts are louder. And that's usually because you have less sensory input going on at the time. There's less to see, there's less movement, and therefore you feel hear your thoughts more. Um, mm -hmm. That is very common. So, so there's a couple of things we can do is, again, the trick here is to manage sleep, the best work you can do is actually during the day. 
where you practice the skill of having a thought, identifying you're having a thought, bring yourself back to the present. Then you'll have another thought. You'll identify you're having a thought, bring yourself back to the present. And when I talk about the present, I'm talking about engage in your five senses. What do you hear? What do you see? What do you smell? What do you taste, right? What does it feel like for gravity to pull you down onto this earth as we talk? Mm -hmm. um, and so that is a practice. Think of it like a muscle, like a bicep curl. And every time you're able to identify the thought, you know, acknowledge that it is a thought, bring yourself back to the present. That's one repetition of a bicep curl. And with practice, that will get stronger. You do mm -hmm. have to practice that on repeat all throughout time to get the benefit of at night, which is being able to bring yourself back to the present. Because often people, when their lights are out, they go into rumination right? Mm -hmm. Ruminate, thinking about trying to solve. Rumination is ultimately mental solving. And we actually want to move away from mental solving because while it might feel productive, it's actually just generating more and more anxiety because it's what you're giving your attention to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so sleep, what I would encourage, what I should have said first off is if you're having anxiety, first remind yourself you don't have to fall asleep. Sometimes the anxiety of I have to fall asleep creates yeah. more anxiety. So just say to yourself, I'm just going to lay here and I'm going to practice my skills. And it doesn't matter how long it takes for me to fall asleep. It's going to get the rest that I need. Even if I'm laying, I'm resting. And so you take all the pressure of falling asleep and then you can practice those mindfulness skills. If you mm -hmm. practice them during the day, you will get better at them during the night. Mm. What are your thoughts when it comes to trying to manage our emotions and anxiety? I listened to one of your podcast episodes where you admitted, although I'm finding it hard to believe talking to you now, that you have a hot temper. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> when we look at anger and resentment, they're quite, un I guess, unpleasant emotions, but we probably shouldn't label them. Jealousy, injustice. Our reactions can cause regret if we respond as well. And I think that's in the heat of the moment, then we can start thinking, oh gosh, what did I say? What did I do? So when our emotions are heightened, that dance with anxiety, I guess I'm just really curious how you advise navigating through that. Well, interestingly, and if it's okay, I'll disclose, I'm very comfortable usually disclosing, I do a lot of that okay. on the podcast, as you can tell, is almost always when I do fly off the handle with ang anger, it's usually because of an underlying anxiety mm -hmm. that I haven't tended to properly, right? So it could be so silly and it may sound so silly, but it might be, you know, I was raised in a really strict family. Um, you know, we very much valued work ethic and family values and everything. And so if my child like gives me a lip, right, or sass or attitude, my instinct is to get really angry. I don't, I've worked very much at managing this, but my instinct is to be like, stop that now. You know what I mean? Like yeah. get really up in their face. But if I'm able to slow down for a second and inquire as to what is showing up in my body, why is this heat showing up in my body, I can pretty quickly get to like, I'm afraid I won't have a respectful child, right? Or I'm afraid that I'm not parenting them correctly. There's usually mm. a fear that shows up for me. And so a lot of times, that's all I need to do is just go, ah, oh, there's that fear. Okay, here it is again. Let's not play that one out. Let's not act out in anger. Let's just mm. acknowledge that I have that fear. And of course I have that fear. A lot of compassion, right? Mm -hmm. um, we also have a little bit of theory around anger, resent, frustration is that, that it shows up when we have an unmet need, right? That anger shows up around unmet needs. And you talked about emotions. So let's mm -hmm. say somebody cuts you off in front of, in the, as you're, you know, parking your car or something. Um, often we will lash out in anger, but then we could actually inquire of like, what was underneath the anger? And it's usually that we feel seen and unseen or unheard or disrespected or, mm -hmm. or not, we weren't, were made little or small. 
Mm. And we're acting in response to that instead of tending to that and nurturing that feeling and, and parenting that feeling ourselves and going, it's, you know, I know they cut you off, but it's okay. It doesn't mean you're not important. It doesn't mean that you're not, you know, valid or respected it it working through what's underneath the anger. But, but again, Mm -hmm. let me just finish by saying it's okay to be angry. Anger is also a normal emotion, right? I think it's most important that you don't act in a way that is painful or problematic to other people. But even if you do, we're humans, a good Mm -hmm. apology and and an amends trying to make it better is okay. I don't want to frame this as you have to get rid of your anger because we're humans. Mm -hmm. We maybe not get rid of our uh, our anger, but what about with anxiety, let's say busters? What are some of your faves? Because sometimes we just need to get it out of our body, right? So it's better Mm -hmm. to release it, exercise or whatever. Like what are some of your top anxiety busters? Well, busters is an interesting word because sometimes anxiety is a physiological chemical in our body or hormone in our body so it takes some time to burn off right so so that's why people get frustrated they're like why is it still here i'm using all the tools and i'm like it's just gonna it's gonna take some time just like if you have a drink it takes time an alcoholic drink it takes time to burn Mm -hmm. off in your body so i would i would encourage people to be as patient as they can with anxiety the more you try and push it past the more you're likely to have and the more frustrated you are to feel. So patience is a beautiful skill when it comes to anxiety. Uh, Another important skill is willingness. Like I said, the bring it on thing, like a really great way to overcome anxiety is to do the thing you're afraid of. If you want to speed your recovery up, go do the thing that you're afraid of. That is a massive anxiety buster. Mm-hmm. if we're thinking long term I like to Sorry. think long term yeah no no yeah. I think it's a beautiful word because again <laughs> I think that and the only reason I'm speaking to this is it's so natural for us to when it comes to anxiety to say make it go away now but mm-hmm. what I often think about is shift your thinking away from the short term and think about the long term mm-hmm. is what's the real anxiety buster patience willingness facing your fear, massive doses of self-compassion, right? Massive doses of self-compassion. Like it's hard. You might even want to validate. This is hard. This is really hard on me. This is painful. You know, it's, it's, it's not fair that you have to feel this way. That validation can be so good for you in the moment and for your long-term recovery and getting support. To be honest, the best buster, asking yourself, what do you need right now? yeah right yeah and 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 working towards that Mm. I suppose maybe because I again I was sort of thinking of myself and what I do so I'd sometimes if I have those moments where I'm like oh I need to get this out of my system I go for a run Gabby Bernstein journals she calls it rage on the page yeah she's a big advocate for that but I actually really appreciate what you said there about you know being more gentle and I guess we're always looking for the quick fix, right? <laughs> well, I, and I think that what you you bring up are some really great points, right? Is there are things you can do in the moment of the panic and anxiety that can nurture you. Rage on the page, taking a walk is so important. You know, cutting back mm. on your caffeine, so important, right? Compassion, so mm. important. And for me, I like to sort of flip-flop between what do I need right now in the present? But what do I need for the long term recovery? But what do I need right now for the present? And what do mm. I need? Because if we get stuck on just fixing the anxiety in the present, um, we sometimes can be not solving the long term problem. And mm. so I sort of flip flop between the two. Um, and that tends to really take care of that little kid inside you who's really scared and just needs some support. In terms of making life more manageable, if we suffer from anxiety, your Instagram is all about sharing practical ways to get your life back from anxiety. So what would be your top three, I'm hesitating using the word non-negotiables, but I'm going to go with it, that are included in your own anxiety toolkit? Sure. 
Number one, self-compassion. We start there every time. You cannot mm. start a practice without that being the key because you could do all the work. I've had clients do the whole work and they beat themselves up the whole time and it does not work and it's not as effective. So self-compassion is the, the absolute non-negotiable. Mm. Under no conditions do you deserve to be beaten up, criticized, judged, shamed, and so forth. The second piece I would say again is the willingness piece. I know I'm repeating myself, but I really, my whole message is around, please try not to engage in a lifestyle where you are running from anxiety. The most empowered you will ever feel, I promise you, is when you face your fear and you look in, back and you go, dang, that was awesome, mm -hmm. right? Like, look at what I did. It was hard, but that willingness to stare fear in the face will change your life. And I'm not saying that like being a motivational speaker. I'm saying it because it's true. Number three, again, I think I'd go back to patience. Recovery is not a linear line up. It is a bumpy ride. It is a messy ride. You'll have ups and downs. You'll take massive steps forward and you will have accidents where things don't go well. And, and I think that is another important life message that mm -hmm. let's just drop the whole A plus idea. Let's look at B minuses for goals and expectations. Mm. So if somebody who's listening right now has been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, can you ever be completely healed or recover from one? Absolutely. Depends on what your definition of healed is. If it means the absence of anxiety in general, no, because you'd be dead. You need anxiety. It's an important part of your life. Right. But can you live a life where anxiety doesn't make your choices? Can you live a life where anxiety doesn't stop you from doing the things you love and stop you from functioning? Absolutely. We can absolutely get there. Mm. And um, final question, as we wrap things up, I ask every guest on the podcast to set us some homework based on the theme of the episode. What is a simple, actionable step that we can take when it comes to managing our anxiety that will help us on our mission to building a happier life. Mm. So at the top of the page, you're going to write, what would I do if fear was not here? Or what would the non-anxious me do in this situation? And in every anxious situation, I want you to ask yourself that question. Do you have to do that thing? No, it might take some time. But the knowledge that you get from that question will guide you towards the life that you want. It's so important. Oh, fantastic advice. Thank you so much for the for the conversation today. I really appreciate it. It's always kind of hard to navigate when you look at anxiety because as we talked about, it's just so broad. Like, yeah. I mean, it must be very varied for you on a day to day. I guess yeah. that's why you've got a whole podcast on, you know, anxiety and OCD, right? Because it is so intricate. Yeah. For more on you, though, people can find you on Instagram at your anxiety toolkit. The podcast is Your Anxiety Toolkit Podcast, wherever you get your podcasts from. And you've also got a book that is available to purchase, The Self-Compassion Workbook for OCD, a step-by-step -step program to help you understand the emotional experience of OCD and develop the tools you need to manage your disorder and build a better life. That's it. And you can get any of my online resources at cbtschool.com. Perfect. Thank you so much again. Really, really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Hello, it's Gabby back with you. Thank you again to Kimberly Quinlan. And thank you to you for making it through another episode of the Happier Life Project. Now, if you are suffering with your mental health, there is a crisis button on the My Possible Self app, which will signpost you to the correct information for immediate expert advice. Those of you who are listening on one of the podcast platforms, the My Possible Self app is completely free to download, so you don't need to worry about it costing you anything. The views expressed in this podcast are solely those of the interviewees. The content of the podcast should not be considered as a substitute for professional or medical advice. The Priory Healthcare are not involved in the production or content of this podcast. 
If you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave us a review. And to find and follow us on social media, we are at My Possible Self and I've been at Radio Gabby. So please do take care and I'll see you on the next one. Bye for now.